this again, and I say this, these kind of things very cautiously, okay? Sometimes I put a theme out or a, a main impetus per se on a, on a book. And uh, I, I say this, the whole Bible points toward Jesus Christ and our need for the Savior, of course, and who God is. But I believe that the book of Romans, the main focus of Romans is the righteousness of God. And as you study this book, he will show you your own righteousness in light of the righteousness of God. And he doesn't compare you to other men, like I'm better than so-and-so and I'm better than... There's no need for that. In true Christianity, in true Christ-likeness, the only one you could compare your righteousness to is Christ's righteousness. And when you do that, you will find every time that you fall short. Romans chapter 8. Now we've been looking at quite a, quite a bit of this. Um, and there's, there's just so many things. I'm going to start out. Um, where do I want to begin this morning? Sometimes we read a little further from the week before, but I like going back. Let's just start in, in verse number 10. Let's just start in verse number 10. That way we can begin to understand where we're left off. We, we've studied into the carnal mind, the fleshly mind. Verse 10, and if, it, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit, that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. I truly believe, and I'm going to begin here, that when we study this very thing, when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you truly, by repentance and faith, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are literally, in that moment, denying the flesh. According to the Scripture, mortifying, you are killing your flesh. You are destroying what literally is running your life, and you are separating yourself from that, and solely by faith. I, I do understand that sometimes we talk to somebody in a different aspect. Somebody came out of a different religion and maybe we'll use a scripture to show them that that religion taught this about God and it's false. Or we may be talking to a young child and trying to give them a little bit of clarity and understanding. But you do not come to God on your own intellect because you know more than others and you finally have understood more than others around you. It's not on your intellect because then if you, if you base your salvation on how much you understood and knew and on your intellect, then you would actually have to put a lot of it on your own ability to get saved. It's not on you, it's on faith that God gives you and literally not putting anything on your flesh at all, but on God giving you the ability to trust Him, the faith that He gives you, and the blood that he shed for you because of his righteousness that you can receive Jesus Christ. If ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You cannot have eternal life without the Holy Spirit. Not possible. Now, I'm careful in saying things like that because there are a lot of people that get into the, well, he's big into Holy Spirit worship and stuff. No, we're not promoting the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit promotes Jesus Christ. And without the Holy Spirit revealing to you Jesus Christ and your need for salvation, you can't get saved. You have to have the Holy Spirit present. You do not just get saved based on intellect. You don't just get saved based on, well, the preacher told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. It doesn't work that way. If there's no Holy Spirit convicting and pointing you toward Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit's not present, it is not going to be salvation. It's not. 
And we have taught so many people in churches all these years, just come forward, say a prayer, do this. In the Bible, you can find people that pray. But in the Bible, you can find people that did not say a prayer. And they still received Jesus Christ. Now, when I said they did not say a prayer, they didn't say it the way we tell everybody you were supposed to repeat after me. What, what is... What does it mean when Paul, or when, uh, not Paul, when Philip says to the Ethiopian eunuch, who says, can I get baptized now? And then Philip says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He says, I believe. Well, let's stop this chariot and baptize him then. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You didn't sit down and say, repeat after me. He says, I believe. He confessed with his mouth, believed in his heart. It fits the exact same pattern of Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It fits it. He confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart. What about the thief on the cross? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Well, he didn't say, I'm a sinner. And the truth is, if the heart is right, if the heart is right and in literal repentance toward God, the words don't really mean all that much. They don't really mean all that much. It's not about the details of the words. And we can go into different things on someone coming to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, but we do know that there is a heart belief and a confession with the mouth. Those are present. We do know that. But the Holy Spirit has to be involved in it too. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit involved speaking through the Word of God, the testimony of God, where we mortify the flesh for the sake of what it is in light of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We mortify the flesh, we receive Jesus Christ. Now, every once in a while, after that, sometimes we let the old flesh revive itself every once in a while, don't we? We shouldn't, but we do. But in order to have eternal life, the Holy Spirit has to be present. Verse number 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. You are a debtor. You owe. Verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What is that teaching? Oh, now, in order to be saved, I have to do good works, right? Is that what it's saying? No. It's saying the evidence, the evidence of being a believer is the Holy Spirit will be leading in your life. There is evidence that you're a believer because the Holy Spirit is in you and he's leading you. Just because you sin, just because you sin after receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior doesn't mean you lose your salvation or you're not being led by the Spirit. It means in the moment you are not being led by the Spirit. That's the truth. The Bible says quench not the spirit. So it's obvious that that's what a believer can do. You can suppress the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can allow the flesh. But the truth is a believer is going to be led by the spirit. You may step off and do wrong. But your God is going to discipline you, as we mentioned before. Or you'll be corrected by the scriptures before discipline. Or a brother or sister in Christ will come up to you and correct you with the scriptures and before you get disciplined and get you back on that path. But a believer is not one who says, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. As soon as I receive Christ, my life is going this way now. And there's no leading of the Holy Spirit. Something's wrong there. Something is wrong there. And when there's never a desire for the things of God, I have. I have at the doors of individuals showed them from the scriptures how they can know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I have had people that in a very sincere attitude bow their head and pray and claim to have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. I've had that happen. And never, ever, ever see them darken the door of a church Never hear of the, in any conversation, they never talk Bible. 
And before long, and I've had this happen before long, they just don't want to talk to me or see me anymore. They want nothing to do with me anymore. I've had that happen. Am I God? No. Do I have the right to say they are not a believer? No, but I do have the right to say they're not acting like someone led by the Spirit. And it gives me a wondering, was their prayer vain? And I will say this, if you come up to me and you will tell me that you're having troubles and trials in your life and you're having difficulties, there are usually two things that I'm going to ask you. One of them is, I don't know how God works in everybody's life, specifically. Well, I'll ask, is it God disciplining you? Is God punishing you? You say, well, I don't know. Then rule it out because God's going to get your attention. If you know it's God punishing you, if you know you're being punished by God, then get something right. But if you, can, if you say, you know what, I have no idea. Well, then God doesn't have your attention. So it's probably just law of sowing and reaping or time and chance happen to them all. But when God disciplines you and gets your attention, you'll know I'm his because he's not going to let me go any further. I know that's a discipline. I've mentioned before, my children know when they get hurt on the playground or when I'm disciplining them. They know the difference. When my child goes down a slide and hits the ground and starts screaming because their backside hit the ground too hard, they don't get up and say, Daddy spanked me. They don't say that. You know why they don't say it? Because they're not stupid. They know the truth. They know that the ground did it. And time and chance, law of sowing and reaping, they went too fast, didn't, pick their, didn't get their feet on the ground fast enough. They know what caused that. And I truly believe if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I truly believe if you know Jesus Christ, and when you do wrong and you know that you're being disciplined, I believe you will have that evidence from the Holy Spirit showing you, hey, this is not just sowing and reaping. This is God's discipline. This is over and above what you might think of sowing and reaping. This is something different. Yes, ma'am. Mm hmm Our own what? Spirit. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, Proverbs 16, 9 says that a man's heart makes his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. Okay. Now, yes, we're going to be disciplined if we're doing something wrong. But if we pray about it prior to, I'm not talking about any big things, I'm talking about And that is something that we deal with, we struggle with continually. And that's why I tell people very clearly, God is the author of peace. The author of peace. He is peace. God is peace. And if there is a inner turmoil, a struggle, there were, and I've used this even in an illustration before, when Paul was traveling on his missionary journeys, there was times that he said, Satan hindered me. And I just didn't go. Well, I can't believe a man like Paul would let the devil get in his way. Wait a minute. Paul understood that God controls the devil and he can allow the devil to be the hindrance or God can use something else. And Paul understood that if there is no peace about it, then it's not of God and I need to back up and not go that direction. So in anything in our life, I've told, I told you all my whole direction was toward the mission field. I mean, I was going to Brazil. I had mission trips planned. I went to candidate school. I was selling all my stuff. I had personal excitement. And trust me, when it comes to reptiles, 
when it comes to piranhas, when it comes to bugs and nature, you're not going to find anybody more excited about catching something wild and crazy. I love that stuff. So I had personal excitement, but I never had peace about it. I never had peace. My wife, I don't know if she was as excited about it as I was, but I was excited, but I never had peace about it. And I literally was pushing my way toward the mission field. I was moving things. I was making phone calls. I preached in a missions conference. I was, I was making my way, but it was like, and I would go home and I'd tell her, I just can't seem to get anywhere with this because there was never a peace about it. It was just a personal excitement. There's, I truly believe that God is a God of peace, a peace that passes understanding. I truly believe that. And so many times in life, we make decisions. My wife and I have made some very poor decisions, probably a lot of them because of my part and my influence. Going out, it's like, you know what? We need a new vehicle. We need to change vehicles. A year or two later, and I'll just use this. God has been so good in my life. Sometimes he foresaw my future, I believe, or what my needs for the future could be if I would just trust him. I had a pickup truck, an extended cab pickup truck. I liked that truck. That's why my wife married me. No, it wasn't. I had a nice truck. We were about to have our first child. And you know what intellect said? You know, this extended cab with the small half doors, that's gonna be too hard to get a child in and out of. I need to upgrade my vehicle. So you know what I did? I upgraded my vehicle. But you know what's crazy about that? Prior to myself getting that vehicle, before I ever got that vehicle, somebody gave me, gave me a 1999 Ford E350 van. Nice condition, 15 passenger. You know what I'm driving right now? A 98. I'm driving a van older than the one I was given. You know what I did? I said, we need the money. I sold that van. It was given to me free and clear. Hey, I got a free van. I sold it for the money. And then traded my truck in on a vehicle more expensive and got more into debt. Why didn't I get rid of the truck and have the van? And the years and years later, the more I look back, I, I, I look back on those decisions that I made and there wasn't peace about them. There was no peace. It was, I, I need to do this. I, it, it, was a, it was a personal, I've got to make these changes in my life. When God had given me a van that is actually newer than the one I'm driving now, years later, God had already provided. There was no peace though, but I made it happen. And, and years later, I can look at it and I can say this. Well, it worked, didn't it? It worked, so therefore it was right. No, I can honestly look back and say, Lord, I did not pay attention to the blessings that you were giving me and I worked it out on my own. I believe with all peace and sincerity, I can look you in the eye and say that. How often do we make decisions? And in looking back, we justify them because it worked temporarily. I believe that's one of the reasons that we as Americans think that as long as we live in debt, and just get, go from one loan to the other, I believe that we think we're doing okay because I'm still surviving. And I regret the day that I bought my very first vehicle as a 19-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old, first vehicle I purchased for $1,500, $2,000, and went and got a loan for it. And looking back, I'm like, I could have paid that off in a couple months of work. But you know what I did? I took a loan out for it. And then I made my $150 payment a month. And then I spent all the rest because I didn't have to, I didn't have bills. I was living off of mom and dad. And I look back at the unwise decisions that I made because I had to make them, I thought, instead of wisely seeking God. You know, my very first vehicle, 
my very first vehicle God gave to me. Literally, I had just got my driver's license. A visitor to the church came. My parents invited him over to, the, to our house for, some, for lunch. He came to the house. He's sitting there at the table. He said, I heard you just got your driver's license. I said, yes, sir. He said, my truck out there is a stick shift, three speed on the column. He said, if you can learn that to drive before I leave, it's yours. I drove him home and dropped him off at his house and drove my truck back home. I didn't eat lunch that day. I was going to drive free and clear. But then I went and got a loan on another truck. And from then I had loan after loan after loan after loan. And my wife and I got to the point where we realized there's no reason to be living like this. Barely just living off of all these payments to the banks. But we justified it for a while because we're making it. But there's never been a peace about them. So I believe when you have a decision to make in life, if God does not give you a pure peace about it, a, if God himself doesn't give you peace, walk away from it. Just walk away from it. And I truly believe that. He will give peace. If, but I'm going to use, I'm going to say this. If we're not living godly, if we are not right with God, then we will justify and say we have peace about things. But truly, when we're following God, He will lead and guide and give us peace or He will put hindrances up there. And before we go to kick a door open, we need to stop and say, Lord, why did you shut that door? And if you shut it, I'm not going to try forcing it. I do believe, like Paul, Paul with his thorn in the flesh three times, he said, Lord, would you remove it? The Lord didn't remove it. He said after the third time, he said, you know what? I knew that God's grace was sufficient. I can live with this thorn in the flesh. He had peace even with whatever was troubling him. He had peace with it because he knew God's grace is sufficient. I can be satisfied with this. Yes. So, Yes. So, so we're going to deal with some of this even in the morning service um, on a topic similar. But here's, here's what happens in our life. When my child comes up to me or my wife and he says, I'm hungry, and that's all he says, what does he do? He leaves it in our hands what he needs to eat and when he needs to eat. But when a child walks up and says, can I have a candy bar? He's taking the time and what he needs out of place and just giving us what I want. And that's many times what we do to God. It really is. Lord, I need this and I want this. Instead of seeking, Lord, you are directing my path. What would you have me to do without and then in our morning service, we'll get into some of this. Sometimes, sometimes God gives you from the scriptures what to do. Sometimes he leads you through godly counselors what to do. How often, how often though do we go to our godly counselors? Godly counselors. And we say, preacher, I think I should do this. You know what my first thought is? You've already got your mind made up. No matter what I say, you've already planned it out. And I've found, I have found over the years that no matter what I say, when somebody comes to me and tells me what they have planned out, no matter what I say, they're not going to listen anyway. They've already got it planned out. I have learned that over the years. If you come and ask for counsel and say, here's what I think I ought to do, I have found Basically, 100% of the time, that is what that individual is going to do without regard for anything I say. I have learned that over the years. Well, that's, why God is our that's why God, the Bible is our counselor, and sometimes he tells us to go to counselors. If I go up to Brother Weldon, who knows plumbing, 
and I say, Brother Weldon, I got a plumbing problem at my house, and here's what I'm going to do about it. You know what he's probably going to do? He's probably going to say, you're an idiot, but go ahead and try it. And then when you're done, call me and I'll see if I can fix it. <laughs> Maybe he wouldn't call me that. Yeah. You know how many times people take their vehicle to a mechanic and tell them what's wrong and how to fix it? You know how many times people go to the doctor and tell them what's wrong with them and how to fix themselves? Don't, don't self-diagnose yourself on the internet. I'm going to say this and we'll be, we'll be done. But let me, let me read this verse before I go on. The Bible, I'm going to read that verse 14 again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The leading of the Spirit does not make you the Son of God, okay? It's evidence that you are. What makes you the Son of God? John 1, 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are His Son. And if you are His Son, the Holy Spirit will be present, He will be in your life, and He will lead you. So the Holy Spirit's leading is evidence of who you belong to and who you are a debtor to. Verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Literally talking to God on that personal note. I'm going to close with this story. There's so much I can, there's so many things I can talk about and, and say. My dad was praying, at, was asked to pray at a funeral. And uh, the majority of the uh, funeral, it was one of his relatives. And they knew that he was a Baptist preacher. And so they asked my dad if he would pray at it out of kindness to my dad being a preacher in the family. But it was a, it was a Catholic funeral. And so the priest asked my dad to come up and pray. And my dad said, I'd love to. So he walks up there and the priest goes like this with his book. He's start here. And my dad said, I thought you asked me to pray. And he said, yeah, yeah, start here. And my dad said, can I just pray or do I have to read your book? And the priest, I'm not joking. The priest said, well, I guess you can pray if you want to. So he steps back with his book and my dad prays. This happens. My dad prays and in front of the whole funeral, my dad finishes praying and the priest said, you sound like you actually talked to God there. My dad said, I did. Who do you talk to? <laughs> I mean, out loud in front of everybody. The thing is, when you can have that personal relationship with the God of heaven, personal relationship. That's something that no man can take away from you. Even in the darkest dungeon, when you're bleeding, having been beaten and ripped apart by the beatings, you can sit there chained up and you can sing out loud to your Savior. You can talk about your Savior and you can have a personal fellowship in the deepest, darkest part of a dungeon. And God say, I'll respond with an earthquake. And I'll break those chains and I'll free you. And Paul and Silas, singing in that prison at midnight, broke free. And then they just waited for the jailer. We're all here. Everybody's fine. When you have that personal walk in relationship with God, what things God can do for us. And I do believe, and I'll say this alone one more time, I do believe God gives peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we close our Sunday school hour, Lord, I am so convinced that you are God, not just because of what the Bible tells me, but because of what you've shown me even in my own personal life, how good you are. And Lord, not just because of what you've done in my life, but listening to the testimonies of others who are growing in Christ and living right. 
And then sometimes seeing the persecution of others, whether it's in their family or whether it's in my family, of people that don't want anything to do with us because of the things of Christ. But we don't, we don't rejoice in persecution. We don't rejoice, but we rejoice that it's just another bit of evidence of who we belong to. I'm grateful to say that you're my father. I'm so grateful. Help me not to blaspheme, mock, ridicule, or use your name in vain. Please, God, don't let us do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.